Well, fellow members of the household of God, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 together this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we'll be uh, finishing this chapter with our focus being exclusively on verses 11 to 16. First Timothy chapter 4, last paragraph in the chapter this morning, verses 11 to 16, the word of the living God reads for us, command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith. And purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And may our gracious God bless the reading and the hearing of the reading of his word. Amen. Father, we love you. We, we bless your name. Father, may you bless this time now as we continue to worship you in the proclamation of your word. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your great condescension through it. That you, the transcendent God, perfect in all things, holy, holy, holy. Uh, the infinite one has revealed himself to us, uh, finite creatures. You, you, have, you have condescended and, and, and revealed yourself to us here in, in these words. Father, that we can take in and store up in our heart, that we, would, that we would know what we are to believe concerning you and what duty you would require of us. Father, may we be stirred up as your people this morning. Um, whether that be in knowing you in, in, a, in, a, in a greater way or simply being reminded of what we already know of you, that we would be reminded and... and fanned up in, in holy zeal to be good servants of yours. As we continue in this passage this morning, seeing what a good servant of Christ uh, looks like. Father, may we be stirred up in these good works that you have prepared for us in Christ Jesus beforehand, that we would walk in them. May we do so by your grace and for your glory. May, may I simply be a, a mouthpiece for your word, Father. May your word go forth in power and in clarity and in love that, that all of your people, including myself, would be built up this morning, that your name would be hallowed in our hearts and minds. Uh, Lord Jesus, our good shepherd, that your sheep would be fed, that we would follow you rightly as you have regulated uh, in truth. Uh, we love you. We bless you. Spirit of God, would you stir these things up? Would you see that these things would be this morning? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. These are words amongst others that we ought to long and desire to hear when we enter into the presence of our Lord. Enter into the joy of your master. Well done, good and faithful servant. There in Matthew 25 where the Lord Jesus speaks these words in a parable we see that these words are exclusively spoken towards his servants who uh, rightly put to use the gifts that he has given them for the embetterment of his kingdom. He says that the kingdom of heaven there is like a man who, going on a journey, called his servants and entrusted to them his own property. And he gave one of his servants, as we looked at last time, he gave one of his servants five talents. And we mentioned then that a talent is equal to 20 years' wages. 
So, so a great amount of giftings was given to this one. Five talents, a hundred years' wages. The second one he gave two talents, and another he gave one talent. And upon his return, this master, upon his return, those who were given the five and the two talents had doubled what he had given to them. And while the one given the mere one talent had simply hid it in the ground out of fear, not using what he was given by his master at all. In church, it was those servants who put to work what their master had given them who were called the good and faithful servants, who used what were placed sovereignly into their hands by him. What he gave to them, they, they used it for his glory, for, for the expansion of his kingdom. It was those who were called the good and faithful servants. It was those who entered into the joy of their master, while the one who did nothing, out of fear, showing himself not to be a true servant at all. He was thrown into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, beloved, regardless of the gifts that the Lord has given us, whether some of us are less gifted than others or not, uh, one thing for sure is that the Lord has not placed anything in our lives for us to just waste them. Amen? He's not given us anything to just hide it in the ground and not use it for His glory and for the sake of His kingdom. He has placed all things in our lives for that very purpose, for us to use them for, for His glory and for His fame and for His honor and for the expansion and a building of His kingdom, of His household. And Brookside, it is exactly that, that the good and faithful servant of Christ Jesus is about the work of in their life. That's what they're about the work of. If we, if we so be Christian this morning, if you're born again, uh, given new life from above by the Spirit of God, if, you, if you've been birthed into the, to the family of God, into the kingdom of Christ Jesus, you are God's workmanship. You are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that you should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. You've been saved by God's grace for good works. You've been saved by the perfect and sufficient works of Christ, attributed to your account, that you would work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And as we began this portion of 1 Timothy two Lord's Days ago, I pray that you saw that regardless of how gifted you may think you are or not, or how, how less gifted or more gifted you are than others, regardless, as God's workmanship, beloved, there is much that the Lord has gifted you in Christ Jesus to be about the work of. There's much that we've all been, been gifted to be about the work of, regardless of our roles in his church. And we saw five ways then last time and how Paul put forward to Timothy that he is to show himself as a good servant of Christ. Five ways as we went through verses 6 to 10 that he is to have a concern. The good servant of Christ is to have a concern for God's church. He is to have a concern for his own soul. That he is to avoid unfaithful teaching. That he is to be spiritually disciplined and that he is to labor in a living hope. Beloved, these are, these are all things, just as with Timothy, that we are all to be about the work of ourselves. Putting truth before the brothers, laying it down as he commanded Timothy, putting it before the church, being nourished ourselves in the truth, not having anything to do with foolish teaching from the imaginations of men, as Paul called them, old wives' tales. We are to be training ourselves vigorously in godliness. Train yourself for godliness, he says in verse 7. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. We are to be vigorously training ourselves for godliness, to be sanctified, to be pleasing experientially in the sight of our Lord. And doing so, we are to be doing this on the basis of who our living God is for us in Christ laboring in a living hope. He says in verse 10, for to this end we toil, we strive, we, we labor, we strive in this. Why? Because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially us, especially those who believe. This is, this is what we all as good servants of Christ called out with a holy calling are to be exemplifying. And as I stated last time, as we are examining verses 11 to 16 this morning, we will see six more aspects of good servanthood 
that we are all to exemplify in Christ Jesus as well. So we saw five last time and we'll see six more this morning and all will have uh, 11 aspects of what it looks like to be a good servant of Christ Jesus. 11 aspects that we all in our different roles and a part of uh, being in the household of God can and, and ought show forth uh, in being in Christ Jesus. And to go ahead and get right into our text, the first one that we'll be looking at this morning from verse 11 the first one is that the good servant of Christ teaches with an authoritative confidence. The good servant of Christ teaches with an authoritative confidence. I, I went back and forth on how I was going to head this. At first I was going to do teaches with authority, and then I thought, no, teaches with confidence, and I thought, I'll just put those together. Teaches with an authoritative confidence. You notice the apostle states to Timothy, command and teach these things. Command and teach them. Uh, that word command we've seen before from Paul. It's the same word that he used in 1 Timothy 1.3 that was translated there as charge. That we're to charge. And in the Greek, this word literally means one who brings a message near or beside someone. And it carries with it, though, more force of just bringing mere instruction. Uh, this word literally means to command, as it's translated here. Or to order someone to go in a certain direction. Uh, using this word and also the word for teaching here concerning these things that Paul is laying out shows that as a good servant of Christ, Timothy is to, just as I've suggested from the heading itself, he is to teach with an authoritative confidence. He, Timothy, just as all good servants, is not to bring forward the truth of Christ's word to others as just mere instruction giving. Right? Or, or just as mere suggestions. But as the words of Christ are inherently true, they are true. As they come from he who is the truth, he, Timothy, he, just as all good servants are to instruct with an authoritative confidence based on that very fact. Timothy is to command these things. He's not just to, to bring forward these things, to just give them over. He's to command in the direction that these things present. Ultimately, because of who these things come from. Because you see, church, if that wasn't so, if that wasn't so, it would be wicked for Timothy to command these things. Uh, it is wicked to enforce and hold others to keep a mere opinion. To, to hold others to submit to just what you think is true and your opinion. Oh, well, this just seems like it would work for us. This just seems like it would work for me. No, it, it is wicked to enforce and hold others to keep a, just a traditional man-made concept because we are not God and God our creator has not given us that type of authority over one another. Amen. Amen. But he has simply laid out the truth for us that we are to love him and in so doing we are to love our neighbor purely as he defines. We are to love our neighbor in accordance with his righteous rules, with his statutes, with his commands. Similarly to what we mentioned last week, beloved, and that a good servant of Christ has concern for the church, which is seen in them putting these things before the brothers, putting truth before the brothers. Here in this heading, we're simply enforcing the point that we are to do this with an authoritative confidence, as we are not speaking the mere words of men, but we are speaking the everlasting truth that has come to us from our God. Now, just as Timothy, beloved, we are to command and speak the word of God with an authority, with authority, knowing whom it's come from. Church, we do this in following our Lord Jesus, who did not speak, well, we read in the Gospels, who did not speak as the other rabbis. You know, the other rabbis would just quote the opinions and the traditions that have come from other rabbis of old. Well, you know, Rabbi this said this, and Rabbi this said that, and so that's what they're teaching. They're just bringing forward what some other rabbi and his interpretation of the word was. But as the God of the word in the flesh, the Lord Jesus, came down, he spoke with an authority. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we read in Matthew 7, verse 28 to 29, it says, when Jesus finished these sayings, when he, when he got through uh, teaching this truth, it says the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. He was teaching as one who had authority and not as the others who were just bringing on tradition. So, beloved, we speak in authority in following the manner of our Lord 
who brings to us the fulfilled authoritative word. And just as well, we do this also in following his commands to do so from his apostles. Beloved, we are to command and teach these things. That, that is a command from Christ through his apostle, through the apostle of Christ Jesus. Command these things as you are teaching them. Just as well, the apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 4, verse 10 to 11, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, so whoever speaks the word of God, he says, speak as one who speaks the very oracles of God. Don't speak as one who speaks just a mere tradition, just something that is passed down from others, something that has just come from man. No, if you're going to speak in the church of God, if you're going to speak truth, speak it as though you're actually speaking it. Speak it with an authoritative confidence. Speak it as though you're speaking the oracles of God. So brothers and sisters, for example, to take this out of the church, when we have a disobedient child in our homes, we don't go to our child and say, you know, child, um, you know, I'm not saying one way or another, but I don't think you should be doing that. You know, I, I, think, I think I should just bring this forward to you. I, I just, I don't think you should be doing that. It probably wouldn't be a good idea for you to be doing that in your life. No, we lovingly command them. We lovingly command them. We, we command them with authority to stop what they're doing as their God has commanded them to stop from his word. It shouldn't stop merely because it's my opinion that they should stop. They should stop because their creator says stop doing what they're doing if they are so going against his word and, been, and being disobedient. And the same as if we have a brother or sister here in the church walking in sin. We don't go up to a brother or sister walking in sin and say, you know, brother... It'd probably be a good idea if you stopped doing that. Brother, you know, it'd probably be a good idea if you stopped cheating on your wife. Things would probably work out better for you. No. Brother, you need to stop now. And in and the, and the name of God and what His Word expresses, if, you, if you're professing to be in Christ Jesus, you need to stop this now. You need to repent. Beloved, we command and teach these things just as the Apostle brings forward to us as he in his time brought forward to Timothy. As good servants of Christ, we teach, we speak with an authoritative confidence in the God of the Word, which is exactly why, beloved, whether it's from me or Nathan or uh, really any other elder that would ever be in this church, it's exactly why from this pulpit you will never hear mere suggestions. You will never hear, you know, it might be a good idea. You're never going to hear a suggestion, but you will hear commands that have come to us from our God. You will hear teaching the Word of God and commanding to follow in what is taught from the Word of God. Brethren, as Paul said, chapter 1, verse 5, here in 1 Timothy, the aim of our charge, the aim of our command is always love. Amen? Amen. The aim is always love. It's always love because love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. Love rejoices in the truth, and that's what's going to be brought forward. That's what we are to bring, uh, bring forward. We're to lay the truth down before the brothers and we're to command them with an authoritative confidence. So that's firstly. Then secondly, as the good servant of Christ teaches with an authoritative confidence and as they would necessarily be showing that in their everyday living, they also model godliness to those around them. That's the second heading. Uh, the good servant of Christ models godliness to those around them. Verse 12 the apostle says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, it is unknown to how old Timothy would have been at this time, but this word translated youth does mean someone who is seen as bearing a youthful age. Uh, it is the same word, for example, that is in the mouth of the rich young ruler when he told our Lord that he had kept all the commandments of God since his youth. But even though we don't know what Timothy's actual age is, if you wanted an educated guess on where he would be at this time, Timothy is probably somewhere between his late 20s to mid-30s here. Probably somewhere to be between late 20s and mid-30s. Uh, we know that Timothy was enlisted by Paul into the mission sometime in the early 50s, sometime in the early AD 50s. And this letter of... Uh, 1 Timothy was written somewhere in the middle of the A.D. 60s. 
So it's probable that Timothy was somewhere in his teens or early 20s when he first met Paul, which would make him thus late 20s, early uh, to mid 30s in this context. And so Timothy is obviously not a new convert, right? As an overseer cannot be, 1 Timothy 3.6. He's not a new convert. He's not a young sapling in the faith by any means because he has had over a decade growing and serving alongside the Apostle Paul. But still with him having a rather youthful age in comparison to other older men whom others may naturally deem as more wise simply because of their age alone, Timothy is commanded here by his father in the faith to not let his age get in the way. Right? Let no one despise you for your youth. Don't let others think that they shouldn't listen to you simply because of how old you are and compared to other others in the church. Don't let anyone look down on you or think nothing of you because of your age. And how is Timothy to obey that command from Paul, from his father in the faith? How is he to obey that? How is he to see to it that no one despises him for his youth? Well, the answer is he is to set the believers an example. He is to set the believers an example. Now that word example comes from the Greek word tupos. That's how it's pronounced. Uh, the way it, it's spelled, it looks like typos. It's actually where we get our English word type from. It's a type or a typewriter and so forth. Uh, at its root, at the root of this word, tupos, the word literally means to strike a blow, to strike something with force. But this word here means either something that is a form or type of another thing, or it means something formed by a blow or by an impression such as with the stroke of a pen, right? You, you put a pen on a piece of paper and you put pressure on the paper and you make a mark. You make a type, a form of something. So just as a pen or just as a typewriter strikes to make a mark uh, or an imprint on a piece of paper, beloved, Timothy is just as well commanded to do that very thing towards the entire congregation here in Ephesus. He is to set the believers an example. He is to set them a mark. Uh, a model, an imprint that they can look at and see exactly how this is supposed to look in following the Lord Jesus. He is to show this in his speech, in his conduct, in his love, in his faith, and in his purity. And, beloved, in the Greek, that is exactly what all of those words mean, just as they are translated there in the ESV. So, just as someone could write down the letter A for someone on a piece of paper so that they can see what that is supposed to look like, so they ought to be able to see what Christian speech, Christian conduct, Christian love, Christian faith, and Christian purity or holiness looks like from the living imprint or mark of those things in Timothy's life. Right? I, can, I should be able to go up to someone and say, can you show me what the letter A looks like? Right? And, and they can make a mark. They can get a piece of paper and make a mark, make an imprint of that, make an example of that. So in the very same way, I, someone should be able to walk up to the church in Ephesus here and say, man, what does a Christian man look like? What, what, what does a godly example of, of Christianity look like in, in love and speech? and purity and holiness. Well, what do all these things look like? They should be able to say, well, look, it's Timothy right there. He's the mark. He's the example. He is the model of all those things. They should be able to see those things in Timothy's life. And brothers and sisters, as Timothy was to be this, so this certainly means in following his example that the rest of the believers were to be this as well. All good servants of Christ are to seek to be models of godliness to those around them to their children, if you're a child, to your parents, to your neighbors, to your fellow family members in the church, everyone. We're all to be seeking to be this, to model godliness to everyone, regardless of our role in the church, regardless of our role in the homes. If we're in Christ, it, it is upon us to be this to everyone around us, to our siblings, to our parents, to our children, what have you. Those in the church, our neighbors, Listen to what our brother Paul says elsewhere in Philippians 3.17. Philippians 3.17, he says, Brothers, join in imitating me. Join in this. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So don't just look at me. 
Look at the other ones who are joining in in that example as well. And we're all to follow in this. So, such that all in the church, all of us are, are simply being models of godliness to everyone else. I can see it in you. You can see it in me. We can see it in everyone. We're joining in that example. That's something by the grace of God and our vigorous training in godliness that we should be able to say to one another, brother, a brother and sister, uh, join in imitating me. Join in this. Keep your eyes on those who are following in that example. And if we can't say that, then brothers and sisters, what are we doing about it? It's a good question to ask yourself this morning. If you can't say that to someone, brother, join in imitating me. Sister, join in imitating me. What are you doing about it? Because you should be able to say that. You should be. As good servants of Christ, we are all to be models of godliness for one another. If we're not, what are we doing about it? How are we training vigorously so that we will be to that place? Where, where someone can say, just as they were to be able to say this about Timothy, they can say, oh, you want to see what a model of Christian speech looks like? Christian purity, Christian love, Christian... You want to see what a... Look at that brother right there. Look at me. Look at that sister over there. Beloved, don't let something in your life be an excuse for your lack of godliness, just as Timothy wasn't to let his age be an excuse. Don't let something be an excuse. Let no one despise you for your fill in the blank. Set the believers an example. Set them an example. If you have Christ and are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, you have all you need to be able to exemplify this. You have all you need. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You have all you need. You have everything you need in Christ to be a good servant of His and be an example to the other believers. And then thirdly, going forward, a good servant of Christ has a word-centered ministry. They have a word-centered ministry. The good servant is given over to or captivated in the direction of life of speaking God's truth in some form or fashion. It doesn't have to be from a pulpit, but they are given over to this, this aspect of their life of speaking God's truth in some form or fashion to those around them. Now here for Timothy, we read in verse 13, Paul says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. And this should be somewhat of a familiar verse for everyone. Uh, I, I didn't do it this morning, but I do somewhat pretty regularly cite it before we have our Scripture reading in our morning services which we do out of obedience to this command. We've been commanded to devote ourselves to the reading or the public reading of Scripture. That's why we have a reading of Scripture during our time of worship. And as Timothy was commanded to devote himself to this in the church in Ephesus, so are we elders in the church at large here to be devoted to this as well. To be devoted to the reading, the exhortation, and the teaching of Scripture. Now that word devote here is actually the same word in the Greek that was translated addicted in 1 Timothy 3.8 concerning what the deacon is not to be uh, towards wine. Uh, the word means to, to turn the mind to, to turn your mind to this thing, to be attentive towards a thing, or to be given over or, or addicted to a thing. And so, very similarly in the contrast to being addicted towards uh, wine, Timothy, and thus all good servants of Christ, are commanded to be turned to and attentive and addicted to this, to the Word, to, to the reading, to the exhortation, and to the teaching of Scripture. That should be central in our lives and our distinctive ministries that we have within the church and as well in our families and in our communities as well. And, you know, in, in looking and studying in this text, I found it actually quite surprising in studying this verse, that the word public is not there in the Greek, nor actually is the word scripture. Uh, the word scripture isn't there in, in the Greek either. Uh, the, the Greek sentence here uh, of this verse literally reads for Timothy to simply be devoted himself to the reading, to the exhortation, and to the teaching. That's what the verse says in and of itself. Just be, be devoted to the reading, the exhortation, and the teaching. 
which I do believe in the context of what Paul has already said, that it should be implied that he is to do this towards the scriptures, so that's probably why they place that in there. But that word reading there simply means reading. So it doesn't necessarily imply that it has to mean a public, open reading before people. But it can also mean a private reading, it's, it's because the word just simply means reading. It can also mean a private reading in one-on-one -on -one counsel or a study group or something along those lines as well. Just really reading across the board. So you can see in that understanding how this command can and does apply to all of us. Because in different respects and within the different roles within our lives, we are to have a word-centered ministry in those things. We are to be devoted to the reading of the scriptures. We are to be devoted to exhortation in accordance with what they say. That word exhortation means a strong encouragement or, or an appeal to follow what is read from the scriptures. And just as well, we are to be devoted to the teaching or the giving of the sense, the giving of understanding of what the scriptures express. Uh, that is what we as elders do from this pulpit, uh, but it's also what we seek to do as well in personal one-on-one -on -one counsel. Uh, at any time, and in our families just as well, leading our families and elsewhere, just as we are all to do so. We are all in different respects to be devoted to the reading, to the teaching, and to the exhortation of the scriptures. So the good servant of Christ, beloved, sums up in, in what I said the heading is for this point. They have a word-centered ministry. They have a word-centered ministry. The word of God is at the center of everything they do, and in their distinctive roles, they seek to let it out and explain it and encourage others in the direction it presents. Amen? And then fourthly, the good servant of Christ faithfully exercises their spiritual gifts. Faithfully exercises their spiritual gifts. In Christ, all born-again believers are given different gifts by the Spirit of God in order to serve the one body of Christ effectually as different members of it. Now that's explicitly taught. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read this, but you can write this down in your notes to read later. That is explicitly taught in Romans 12, verse 3 to 8, and also 1 Corinthians 12, the whole chapter. Uh, after speaking of different varieties of gifts that there are, there in 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul says in verse 11 that all these... All these gifts, these different varieties of gifts that the Spirit of God gives to different members of the church, he says all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills, as the Spirit himself wills. And so as, as God the Spirit chooses, as he, as he wills, we within the body are given different gifts. We are all as different individual members of the one body of Christ, uh, gifted to serve as different members are given different gifts by the Spirit in, in order that the body would come together in unity and work together to endure and to grow. Uh, we within the body are given different gifts, or, or, or you could say, because it, it's I'll, I'll read from 1 Peter, it is brought about in the sense we're given different manifestations of God's grace, not as saving grace, but, but grace in these giftings. We're given different manifestations of God's grace for his glory and for the upbuilding of his people. As I said, that's how the Apostle Peter words it. Uh, actually, it's in finishing a verse that I quoted earlier, 1 Peter 4, verse 10 to 11. He says, as each has received a gift. So just to remind you, that, that does mean that along with what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, every Christian is given a gift. You, you're, if you're a Christian, you've been gifted by the Spirit of God. As each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So there is varied grace there. He, it, it varies towards the different believers. He gives one, one kind of gift, one another kind of gift, and so forth. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. But then whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And so... While in different respects we've all been called to speak God's word and we've also been, all been called to physically serve one another. Well, beloved, there are those within the church who are gifted by God to do more of one or the other. To do more, to, to speak the word of God or to serve uh, physically. Uh, which are both vitally important for the unity 
and the building of the body to function as it ought. We need those who are building up the body spiritually and those who are building up the body physically, speaking the word of God and serving. And, you know, I know there, there are those spiritual gift tests out there. You might have taken one before. Uh, I have. But, uh, beloved, there is no test to figure out your giftings. That's just something that people have come up with. That, that's not something that is expressed in the Word of God. Uh, all you need to do is get to work and serving your Lord, and your giftings will be made evident. Amen. Amen. That, that's, that's how it is. Uh, you get to work and serving your Lord, and your giftings will be made evident. The church will, will, will affirm your giftings. They will see your giftings as, as they stand out as you simply get to work in serving your Lord. Just get to work. Do what your Lord has called you to do in your life across the board, and your giftings will show. They will be made evident as we serve together, I assure you. And that's exactly what the apostle shows here. When he tells Timothy to not neglect his gift, which was given to him by or through prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on him. Uh, that's verse 14 in our text. And beloved, Paul isn't saying here that Timothy's gift was given to him by the means of prophecy, as though the elders spoke the word of God and somehow imparted that gift to him. You know, they, they spoke and it was then granted to him at that time. But what he's saying is that through their prophecy, through their speaking of the word of God, when they laid hands on Timothy, they were confirming and they were identifying the gift that had already been bestowed upon Timothy uh, by our gracious and sovereign Lord. They were confirming what God had already done and gifted Timothy with. Now, we don't know because it doesn't say. We don't know what gift this specifically was that Timothy had. Now, most likely in the context is the gift of teaching or the gift of being an overseer. But we definitely see that it was identified by the church and the elders then set Timothy apart for the task that God had called him to. And in line with all these other commands and being a good servant of Christ, beloved, what Paul is telling young Timothy here is exactly what we just read that Peter commanded of all of us. Uh, that just as he has received a gift, he is to do what? He is to, he is to use it to serve God's church as a good steward of God's very grace towards him. He's not to neglect the gift that God has given him. Do not neglect the gift you have. That is a command. Don't neglect it. Just as Peter said, you are to steward it well. You are to use it. God does not gift us to hide things. God does not gift us to keep things to ourselves. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was confirmed by the church. Beloved, a good servant of Christ doesn't waste what Christ has sovereignly given them to serve him with. They get to work with what they've got. Whether it be two talents, whether it be five talents, whether it be one talent, whether, whatever it is. We are to use what he has given to us for his glory and for the embitterment of his kingdom. The good servant of Christ faithfully exercises their gifts. Well, then fifthly, fifthly this morning, the good servant of Christ progresses spiritually. Progresses spiritually. As the good servant is showing forth all of these qualities in line with the word of God and training themselves for godliness, Necessarily in that, they should be progressing and, and growing more and more mature in their spirituality. Growing more and more in that godliness, which is exactly what the apostle tells his son in the faith in verse 15. What does it say? Practice these things. He's reiterating some things he's already said before, but practice these things, immerse yourself in them. Why? So that all may see your progress. So that all may see your growth. That you're not just at a stalemate in your spirituality, but in being an example to everyone, you are progressing in godliness. You're progressing in your spirituality. You're progressing in your knowledge of the word and applying it to your life and your counsel and so forth. You're, you're growing. It should be seen. Now that word progress means in the Greek to advance. To advance or to go forward, which is exactly what we should be doing, beloved. Uh, all of us, as in Christ, our God has predestined us to be what? To be conformed into the image of the Son, Romans 8, 29. We've been predestined to be conformed, to, to grow into, to be conformed and molded into the image of the Son. And in that predestined plan, 
Church, His grace has come into our lives to train us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. That's Titus 2.12. The grace of God has come into our lives for that. To throw away, to throw away ungodliness and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. That's a part of being molded into the image of the Son. That holy calling that He's called us out with. More and more in our lives, as we experience God's means of grace, as we gather in worship and fellowship with His church, as we are stirred up by His Spirit in accordance with His Word, beloved, we should be growing spiritually in holiness to, to continually be ren uh, renouncing sin in our life, continually being about the work of putting to death sin in our life, and to live maturely as God has saved us and Christ has died for us too. Now, I know the world today likes to give so many excuses for why they act the way they act. The world, well, we've been doing that since Adam, have we not? It was the woman you gave me. And then Eve, oh, it was the serpent. We've been giving excuses since the beginning of the fall. Uh, some of them, well, you know, I'm not a morning person. I haven't had my coffee yet, so that's why I'm such a jerk. So that's why I'm acting like this. No, no it's because you need to repent. There's still sin in your heart. I'm not a morning person. Well, you know, I just like to keep to myself, so that's why I don't, I don't go talk to anyone. That's why I don't go love anyone, as I've been commanded to in Christ. And, you know, I just like to keep to myself. You know, I'm a type this personality. I'm a type A or a type B, so that's why I'm like this. I'm this, I'm that. Beloved, we don't get to make those excuses in Christ. We don't. That's, those are worldly excuses. Those are sinful, selfish excuses that are seeking to just justify why we're being sinful. But we don't, we don't get that in Christ. We don't, we don't get that opportunity to make those excuses. And certainly, really those in the world don't get it either because everything is going to be revealed in the judgment. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. What are we told for us in Christ? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4 tells us that our God's divine power, saint, member of the household of God this morning, our God's divine power has granted to us some things that pertain to life and godliness. No, all things. Our God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them, so through those great and very precious promises, through them, we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Because of that, beloved, because of that very truth, we've been given all things for life and godliness by our God's divine power, through His knowledge, by His grace, by His, His promises, we've been given the ability to escape the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Because of that, the good servant and practicing and immersing themselves in all that God has graciously and sufficiently given them in His Word, they will progress spiritually. They will. Amen. They will progress spiritually. Now, it may not just be perfectly continual to where you're just through the roof, but you will be able to look from where you were when you first confessed Christ to where you are now, and you will most definitely be able to see growth. I may not be uh, where I want to be right now, but praise God, I'm not where I used to be. Amen. That is the saint of God. That is the child of God. By the power of God and His grace, the good servant of Christ will advance. They will move forward in godly progression. They will progress spiritually. And then sixthly and lastly, beloved, for this morning, the good servant of Christ is vigilant. They are vigilant. They are watchful. Verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. <coughs> Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Keep a close watch, the apostle says. The Greek word here means, uh, literally means to hold on to something. That's what the word means. Hold on to something. Stay somewhere. Stay in this place. Give attention to this thing. You can really see how what Paul is saying here applies to all of those. Give attention to this. 
Hold on to this. Stay here and here alone concerning this sound doctrine that has been given to you, that has been entrusted to you here as a good servant, as an elder there at the church in Ephesus. Do this for yourself and for your hearers. And being a good servant of Christ in the role that God had specifically given to Timothy there in the church in Ephesus, he is to see to it that he keeps a close watch, uh, that he is to be vigilant on what he is teaching. Because as we've already greatly addressed in the importance of the Word of God in, in many of these other headings, understandably, beloved, it is the teaching. It is proper and right, consistent teaching in, in accordance with the Word of God that is used by our God to save not only Timothy, but the hearers as well. It's to save all of His people. What we know of God and His will for our lives in accordance with the Scriptures necessarily greatly affects how we either rightly or wrongly serve Him or worship Him, function together as His household. Right? What we know of God and His Word is going to affect, right? what you think affects what you do. And so how greatly I know of what He has accurately and clearly revealed in His Word is going to affect how I rightly or wrongly serve Him or worship Him or function as a good servant. And so the good servant, beloved, is to be vigilant. They are to be watchful concerning the teaching and how it is being applied in their own life and the lives of those hearing it. Uh, this is exactly what Paul said as well to the Ephesian elders. We've mentioned this text uh, several times as we've made our way through 1 Timothy. But there in Acts 20, uh, beginning in verse 28, the apostle says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Pay careful attention. Be watchful. Be vigilant. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. And it's after that where Paul then speaks of those who would rise up and they would speak twisted things amongst them to which he commended them to God and to the word of his grace. He commended them to what? To the teaching, just as he says here. To the teaching, which is able to build them up and give them the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And as we've already mentioned that overseers are examples to the flock, beloved, this is understandably something that we should all be doing. This isn't just a job for overseers, to be watchful toward themselves and to their hearers. Uh, we are all to be vigilant. We are all to be watchful. Uh, we are all to keep a close watch on ourselves and what is being taught uh, in our homes and in our church. We are to examine ourselves, beloved. We are to examine our thinking. We are to examine our action, our lives. We are to examine all of this against Scripture to see where we ought to change course, if need be, only in line with what God teaches in His Word. Because all we want to do is jo joyfully serve our Lord the way that he has just clearly revealed for us. Amen? Amen? That's what we want to do. The Lord said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross and follow me. And that's all we want to do. We just want to follow him. Not the way that we, we think we should, not the way that the world thinks we should, but the way that he clearly reveals that we should. And so, brothers and sisters, we must be vigilant in our lives because sin is waiting at the door. And we live in a world that is actively seeking to swallow us up, actively seeking to, to bring us into their ungodly rebellion against our Lord. And we ourselves are not yet perfected. There is still the, the flesh that we have to deal with. So we must be vigilant. We must be actively seeking to watch ourselves in accordance with how we are thinking and living out the truth within this world. And certainly, beloved, in being watchful concerning the teaching here in this church, here in Brookside Baptist, Beloved, if one of the elders here or, or anyone ever teaches something that is against Holy Scripture, one of you vigilant good servants better be coming to us to speak about it. If I ever say anything that is against the Word, in being a good servant of Christ, in watching yourself and the hearers, you should come to me and speak to me about it, that I may be graciously corrected by, by my God through you in being a good servant of Christ. Out of love for your Lord, His truth, His elders, and His church, the hearers here, all of us, the children here, those who have not yet, yet repented and, and have come to the faith, uh, you must, you must come 
see to it that the truth is being expressed. The good servant of Christ is vigilant, beloved. For the glory of God and for the upbuilding and salvation of his people, the good servant is vigilant. The good servant of Christ is watchful to themselves and to the teaching that is being brought out in their midst amongst those that they are around. And as we have now concluded looking at Paul's specific commands for Timothy there in Ephesus in the first century, well, Brookside, we have seen a wonderful snapshot of what the good servant is to look like even today in Myrtle Springs, Texas in the 21st century. But the good servant has concern for God's church. The good servant has concern for themselves or their own soul. The good servant avoids unfaithful teaching. They are spiritually disciplined. They labor in a living hope. They teach with authoritative confidence. They model godliness. They have a word-centered ministry. They faithfully exercise their gifts. They progress spiritually and they are vigilant. They're watchful. Uh, these ones who show this by the grace of God, beloved, the grace of God powerfully working within them, these are those who hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So, beloved, may our master this morning mightily stir us up with a holy zeal, a holy zeal to use to use that which he has gifted us as he would have us to. May there be no worthless servants amongst us. Amen? Amen. May it never be. And to that end, beloved, may our gracious master bless the preaching of his word. Amen. Father, may you do that very thing. Son, Spirit, our, our triune God, may you do that very thing. May you bless the preaching of your word. May you bless it for your glory, for, your, for the hallowing of your name in our hearts and minds. King Jesus, for the expansion of your kingdom amongst us, for the joy of your people, may you bless it. That we would be doers of your word. That we, out of our love for you and thus love for neighbor, that we would put to use that which you have gifted us to use for your glory and for the embetterment of your people. May we not be worthless servants. May we not be one as, as he with the one talent who out of fear hid, uh, hid what you had given him, hid what his master had given him. May we be those who get to work. May we not seek to, to judge whether we have enough, uh, enough fruit or enough this or enough that uh, to use because Lord Jesus, in you, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And as we've seen here, uh, Lord Jesus, from your apostle, as, or, or through his commands to young Timothy, there is much, as that applies to our lives even today, there is much that we can be about the work of. Having concern for the church, being nourished in the truth, being examples to one another, faithfully uh, exercising our gifts, all of these wonderful things. May, may you stir us up out of a love for you to show them forth. And where we aren't showing them, may you stir us up to be those as good servants of Christ who are training vigorously for that. Training, laboring in a living hope. May you bless that to your glory and for the joy of your people. May you bless the rest of our worship this day and our fellowship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.